when you're going to take such a serious act, like charging a sitting president of the United States, whatever you might think of them politically, you want it to be very, very clear that a crime has been committed, that a serious crime has been committed, and that you have the absolute authority to bring the charge. I'm Ian Bremmer, and welcome to G Zero World. I'm here in Disney, Orlando, Florida. There are children literally everywhere. We are gating them away so I can have this small area of personal sanity and bring to you this week the former prosecutor of Southern District of New York. That's right, Preet Bharara. We've got puppet regime and right now your world this week. I'm going to start with Hawaii. Don't usually do that, but in this case, for 38 heart-wrenching moments, the citizens of Hawaii thought that a North Korean ballistic missile was incoming and they had to call their loved ones, or not if they didn't have any. Um, the point is that we've got technology that people increasingly don't understand, can't really deal with. You remember when Trump was off of Twitter for 11 minutes? That was just one guy with a button. Here you have one guy with a button that presses it and suddenly everyone thinks that they're about to blow up. Look, part of the problem here um, is that we have so ratcheted up tensions with the North Koreans that people do believe that nuclear war is thinkable um, and that uh, we might be facing uh, an ICBM coming our way. That doesn't take 38 minutes, by the way, from North Korea. It's probably between 20 and 30. It's going to feel better over the next few days, few weeks, because we've got the Olympics coming up and we have a joint South-North Korean female ice hockey team. I promise you they will lose very, very quickly, but it's going to feel good for a while. But after that, we're back to test and hopefully no more cell alerts. Next, President Trump not going to the United Kingdom. He says it's because about real estate and as a real estate guy, he should know, right? It's a new U.S. embassy, really expensive, about $2 billion. He blames the Obama administration. They are the ones that negotiated the price um, for uh, selling the old building, though it was originally a Bush decision. That is not why he's not going. He's not going because there were going to be really big demonstrations that were going to cause a problem, not just for him, but also for the embattled Prime Minister of the UK, Theresa May. Frankly, a good decision for both of them. If he wants a trip that goes off well, may want to go back to Riyadh. And finally, I want to tell you that word that Trump used to describe all those African countries, but uh, it's Disney and they may not let you use language like that, but you know what I'm talking about. In the United States, it's pure politics. It's Democrat versus Republican. Watch your favorite cable news channel. They'll give you the message you want. But internationally, this is not good for American influence. It's already eroding. It's fantastic for Xi Jinping. His Chinese government dominates all these African economies and uh, they don't call them bad names. They just take all their resources. They're going to do a little more of that going forward without much pushback from the United States. That's it from the Magic Kingdom. I have much better fictional characters coming your way. Puppet regime. Tired, bored, tired, bored and huddled. Right. Help! Help! Come in here, please. Take this down, will you please? <clears throat> Give me your tired, your bore, your huddled Norwegians. Right. That's beautiful. Tremendous. What a shit of Puppet regime! A friend of mine gave me some advice when I went to go meet with him. But don't don't be upset and offended when you walk into Donald Trump's office and he won't laugh anything you say. He'll smile, but he won't Welcome everyone here in the Eurasia Group headquarters, Flatiron District, New York City. Right place to be talking to Preet Bharara. He is the distinguished scholar at NYU School of Law, not far from here, also was, of course, U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. That includes where we're sitting right now. And you listen to his podcast, Stay Tuned with Preet. Preet, delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. So how, how inappropriate, scale of one to 10, how inappropriate do you find this administration? He says certainly an awful lot of things that imply yeah. that he wants to erode these institutions, make them subservient to him, make them more political. But how much has he actually done? I'm not concerned about Congress as a whole. I'm not concerned about the executive branch as a whole. I'm not concerned about the judiciary as a whole. But I am concerned about this element of rule of law where people have come to appreciate and have faith in and trust in the fact that when law enforcement decisions are made, they're made based on the facts and the law. And not because a particular politician, whether it's a president or a senator or someone else, you know, wants an enemy to be hurt and you think, that's, an you think that's now changing? I think the feel of things is, is certainly that. I mean, look, what's one of the things that the president has been most angry about? 
He's been most angry about the staunch conservative former Republican Senator Jeff Sessions, who he installed <clears throat> as attorney general. He's most upset that he recused, recused himself. himself. Yes, after he told him not to. And the president of the United States has done everything he can to assail that decision, say it was wrong, say if Jeff Sessions had told me in advance he was gonna do that, I would have appointed someone else. For what purpose? For what purpose did he want this person to be not recused? He wanted him not to be recused and still involved in the case to protect him. So let me now ask you uh, specifically about the Mueller investigation. Do you think he can avoid a direct interview with Robert Mueller? The president has said repeatedly that he's happy to do it. He's happy to testify under oath. Um, I'm sure his lawyers don't want him to do that. I'm sure they don't, yeah. Because he's not great with the truth, with one caveat that I'll mention in a moment. He could decide he doesn't want to do it. There's no collusion here, so what's the point? Why right, would they exactly. even want an interview? Yep. It sounds like he's laying the groundwork mm -hmm. not to have to give an interview. Right. And then the Mueller team has a choice. They can say, well, fine, there's something called a grand jury subpoena mm -hmm. that you're not immune from so far as we believe there's an argument you know, for that, for that position. And the president can decide either to comply that way, which usually doesn't happen in that case because they'd rather cooperate in a non-grand jury environment, in an interview environment, without having to look like they were compelled to testify. Mm -hmm. Or you say you're taking the Fifth Amendment. And then mm -hmm. there are lots of sort of issues related to A, what that looks like politically and publicly, and B, whether you have an actual basis to assert that privilege. My guess is at the end of the day, the, the, a normal person in President Trump's position, who's a high ranking person, who believes that nothing he did was wrong or unlawful because of the political considerations and also potentially the legal considerations, does an interview with the FBI. Now, this is not a normal person. Right. He does not it's do not things in the, in the normal way. It's right. not a normal circumstance. It's not a you know, garden variety investigation. So I'm not gonna predict how it's gonna end up. But the other point I was gonna make is this, you know, you know, we both smiled and nodded at each other when we said, you know, the lawyers probably don't want him to testify yeah. in any way, shape, or form because he puts himself in legal jeopardy. And you said with an exception. What's the exception? Just because he acts in a crazy way on Twitter and he lies repeatedly about crowd size and, and conversations that were had and the president's birth certificate, prior president's birth certificate and things like that does not necessarily mean that he's going to be a babbling, crazy, self-incriminating maniac when he is presented with a serious prospect in a conference room of dealing with and answering questions from you know, very, very serious, rigorous lawyers. He can be careful when it matters. Yeah, which to me, by the way, separate and apart from what the legal jeopardy is, mm -hmm. indicates to me that he's smarter than a lot of people give him credit for. And he, and he knows, that tells you he knows how to be careful when he wants to be, when he cares about it, when he, think it's, when he thinks it's gonna have some consequence. So I, I actually don't think he walks around blabbing like a child, like some people wanna infantilize him in that way. He, he's not. And these, these examples of how he conducts himself when it's a legal proceeding are very interesting in that regard. So what's the piece of the investigation so far that you view as most serious, impactful, problematic for the president? I think all things relating to obstruction seem very serious to me. Um, they don't all emanate from the firing of Jim Comey, but a lot of it sort of begins with the firing of Jim Comey. All the ways in which the president has said he wants the Russia investigation to go away, the fact that he asked Jim Comey for his loyalty, which I credit, the fact that he asked Jim Comey to lay off on Michael Flynn, which I credit, the fact that he told Lester Holt, which we must credit because it happened on television, you know, and everyone saw it in the country, uh, that when he fired Jim Comey, he was thinking about the Russia investigation, the fact that there was a pretextual memo to my mind, that was prepared by Rod Rosenstein that said the reason Jim Comey was being fired was because of the way he treated Hillary Clinton. So all, all of these uh, motivations seem to be at odds with each other. There seem to be a lot of lies about them. And when you bring a, a criminal case, particularly an obstruction case, part of what you want to convince the jury of is that your narrative makes sense. And he did this thing, whether it was the firing of Jim Comey or other things that he did, because he was trying to have an influence on an ongoing proceeding. And the more evidence there is of his anger about it, the more evidence there is that he was trying to cover that up by having this memo that talked about something that nobody in their right mind thinks was the basis for the firing of Jim Comey. The memo from the deputy. The memo from the deputy. Mm -hmm. You know, the more obfuscation there is about an act that you did that you otherwise are saying, I had absolute legal authority to do it, makes you question that. If the investigation goes forward and they believe that they have enough to quote unquote get President Trump for obstruction of justice, um, 
what what happens? How how did that's that? A, that's a, I don't know. <laughs> that's a, I mean, there there is there is a long-standing opinion at the office of you know written by the Office of Legal Counsel, OLC, which is sort of you know within the Justice Department, the independent sort of legal mind and legal heart of the Justice Department, and it has been long, I think, accepted a consensus acceptance of the principle during the Clinton administration since then that the Constitution does not permit the indictment of a sitting president of the United States for various reasons. And there is, you know, there's other scholarship that suggests maybe that's not true, and people talk all the time on programs like this and elsewhere, saying there is, there is support for the idea that a president can be charged criminally while he's sitting in office. My guess is, uh, and I said this, I'm saying this on the podcast this week, if people want to hear more about it, yeah. um, that when you're going to take such a serious act, like charging a sitting president of the United States, whatever you might think of him politically, and remember the special counsel's office is supposed to be above politics, um, it, it, you want it to be very, very clear that a crime has been committed, mm -hmm. that a serious crime has been committed, and that you have the absolute authority to bring the charge. And if there's any question or doubt in any of those three things, and the one we're talking about is whether or not there's authority mm -hmm. to charge a sitting president, I think you undermine uh, faith in the rule of law. I think you undermine credibility in the special counsel's office, and I think you cause, you know, something of a crisis in the country because you're giving people reason to think that it's that it's an unfounded charge. How much of this makes you concerned about heading towards constitutional crisis? In recent memory, we have not had a president who has, I think, attempted to create a chilling effect on people exercising their independent law enforcement duty. I think we haven't had a president in modern times who has had such a terrible relationship with the truth. Um, not that he's gonna have any success in shutting down the failing or failed New York Times, but what he does do is he sows a lot of lack of faith and mistrust in all the basic American institutions. Now, there are judges who get things wrong, Trust me, I had that view, not infrequently, when I was the United States Attorney. There are reporters who get things wrong, and there are reporters who are bad people. There are people in Congress who are bad people. That's all true. But what he's doing to a degree that I've not seen before is trying to make it appear that none of them have any integrity, that no one's really doing their job. He only praises people when he likes the decision that they make or the coverage that they give him, and he despises and undermines people if he doesn't like the opinion or doesn't like the coverage they're giving him, or doesn't like the decision they've made in a court or somewhere else. And it's literally every decision is made and, and, and criticism and praise is based not on principle or truth. It's always based on whether it's good or bad for Donald Trump. And because there are you know, tens of millions of people who support him, no matter what, it a little bit twists the way we think about things. And there are, I think, a few voices who stand up for principle and truth. And it doesn't mean that Donald Trump lies about everything. You know, he's right about some of his assessment sure. about America. I mean, I, I said all the time, you know, he was right. There is a swamp. I don't think he's draining it. I don't think he knows what it is exactly. Um, lots of people have been forgotten. That's absolutely true. The system is rigged. We tried to do what we could, you know, to, to rectify the ways in which the system was rigged on Wall Street and elsewhere. So he's not always wrong, but he does enough to sort of undermine any kind of traditional sense that institutions can be composed of people who act on principle and based on truth, I think that's very dangerous. Winter is coming, sounds about right. I thought winter was last week. <laughs> we're still I think coming. we're on a thaw now. It's coming long term. Yeah. Preet, thanks so much. Thanks for having Good me. Good to see you. That's it, but come back next week where we have Maggie Haberman. She is clearly the most exciting reporter to be following in the country right now on the White House beat. Unless of course, there's an incoming ballistic missile. Let's all hope we'll be back.